Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to our series on a history of Western thought, why we think the way we do. And I'm starting and ending every lecture with this site, which is where the, the videotapes of these lectures are, as well as other lecture series that we've done. In fact, if you go to this website, litchapala.org, there's a tab that says eight-week lecture series. There's another tab that says the Windstar Talks, which are the talks that, that, that I did done them here in Ahihi, but I created them originally for cruise ships, but then there's also over 400 hours of lecture uh, from our Lakeside Institute of Theology on there. It's all free. Uh, there are PowerPoint presentations with all of it, so you're welcome to that. So today is week four of our discussions, and today we're going to be talking about the theme of process. We're going to look at GFW Hegel, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, some of you might not think of Darwin as a philosopher, but certainly his, uh, his work had a philosophical impact beyond probably anything he even imagined. And Alfred North Whitehead, so we're going to talk about that. But first, I want to, uh, and then let me emphasize, we do not have a lecture next week. No lecture a week from today on September 9th. Carolyn and I will be in Wisconsin for her father's 104th birthday celebration. So we will um, not be here for next week. Um, I mean, you can come if you want, which will be if you're sitting here. <laughs> this is what we've looked at so far in terms of identifying the major themes in Western philosophy. I obviously am not picking every philosopher in the Western world. And I'm picking the ones that I think either give a kind of foundational understanding or begin to express things that we see dominant in the way we think today. We started out identifying the two major themes in philosophy, idealism and materialism. Idealism being the belief that what we know, or how we know reality is with our minds, or something that is internal to us, versus materialism, the idea that reality is external to us and something we experience with our senses. We started out with Plato representing idealism, his belief in the, the higher forms that exist somewhere, that there is a a per perfect form of everything we experience in the material world, and that that's th the greater reality. And then his student Aristotle disagreeing and saying the physical world is, re is what reality is. We talked about St. Augustine being in the Platonic, or Plato's mode, and Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic scholar, being, and they were philosophers as well as theologians. Uh, Aquinas being in the materialism uh, mode of Augustine. We then got into modern philosophy, which is the first four were kind of to lay the foundation for where we go from there because virtually everyone after Plato, Aristotle, and then Augustine and Aquinas following them, almost everyone after that followed one of those two schools or streams of thought, either idealism or materialism, in one way or another. René Descartes, the French philosopher, really is considered the father of modern philosophy. Very famously, I think, therefore I am. We'll talk about that. So he was very much an idealist. I think, therefore I am. My, my internal rational processes is what makes reality for me. John Locke, the English empiricist, meaning he sort of invented the scientific method, observation of the material world. He's the one that said tabula rasa, that human beings are blank tablets until we experience the physical world. Then we talked about David Hume, the radical skeptic, that you cannot know anything for sure. Um, Immanuel Kant, one of the most important of the philosophers of history, probably right up there with Plato, who uh, said that reality was my mind taking the input and organizing it. And so my mind was actively involved in the process. And then we talked about Friedrich Schleiermacher, Schleiermacher being the father of modern liberal theology, who basically changed the idea. Um, Schleiermacher is the one who shifted theology from focusing on God to focusing on me or on us. That the point wasn't that theology dealt with God, or rather it dealt with my experience of the divine. He wouldn't even talk about God as a, as a personal being. Now, where I'm going with all of this, uh, we've got enough now under our belts that I want to start giving you some kind of outline that will lead us into a modern thinking of it. And first, these are some of the, the progression of philosophical thinking that brings us into modern times. I'm going to be adding to this list as we go along. There are several isms that we see today, and I want to start linking the sources of those things and some of the philosophers we're talking about to today. The first one, I could actually break into two, but I'm gonna, because they're so closely related, especially with the philosophers that dealt with them, I'm calling it subjectivism, rationalism. Basically, this means, the subjectivism part is, it's about me. It's about what I experience or think or prefer. 
the idea that it's all what my uh, process is. The rationalism part of it is rationality is the only source of truth. In other words, not feeling, not experience of beauty, not emotion, it's just rationality. Okay? Um, examples that we've already talked about of that is Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. That is both a, a radical statement of subjectivism, meaning I think, therefore I am, focuses on me. That reality is, is what I experience, not that it's some neutral thing that exists out there that everybody experiences as well. And I think my rationality is what determines reality. So this is the subjectivism, I, and the, re the rationalism, you know. Now, I understand, realize I'm not saying, when I say rationalism, that's not the same as rationality. Rationality means using your reason in a good way. Rationality is a positive thing. Rationalism is the belief that only reason will bring you to the truth. And when Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, it most notably was not, I feel, therefore I am, or I believe, therefore I am, or I experience, therefore I am. I think, that's rationalism, that thought processes, the use of the mind is the only source of truth, okay? Similarly, Kant said that <clears throat> reality is created as my brain organizes my experience. <clears throat> that is both subjectivism, my brain doing, you know, reality for me is what my brain does. There's nothing external to that that I could consider reality. And it is based upon reason. It is my brain. It's not my heart. It's not my emotions. It's not anything else in my experience. It's my brain, my rationality. So you see subjectivism and rationalism, both of those. And thirdly, Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher, who is primarily a theologian, but a philosopher as well, and there's a lot of crossover in these. We'll see that uh, today as well. Schleiermacher said, religion is not about God, it's about my experience of the divine. Particularly, he said, it's my experience of, of a sense of dependency on the divine. But it's no longer about God, as though God were a, an objective reality outside myself. It's how I perceive it. How I perceive and experience the divine. All three of these are examples of something we see very dominant in modern thinking, and that is, it's all about me. Somebody once observed that the popular magazines used to be life and time. Then they became, it became people, and etc. Now, there are magazines, me, self, you know. It, it, there's a fundamental change that's reflected in all, different, all sorts of different ways in our society by the fact that we've become ultimately subjective. It's only if you're really subjective that you can say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me, because truth is what I perceive. Doesn't matter. It's not like there's anything objective out there that is true or not true. That's the subjectivism. And it's what I can rationally understand, the rationalism. Another mode, scientism, and that is the belief, notice that's not science, it's scientism. Scientism says that science and empirical observation, that scientific observation, are the only sources of truth. There is no truth to be found in an experience of beauty, or of emotion, or of faith. Those things aren't real. The only thing that's real is what you can prove scientifically, which is a movement called positivism. We're going to talk about that some later. John Locke is one of the best examples of the people we've looked at so far, because John Locke really is the father of empirical science. And he said, humans are tabula rasa. In other words, you're an empty shell. There is nothing to you until you experience physical phenomena. And that's what builds, those experiences build the content of who you are. So obviously, Unless you experience something empirically with your senses, which is scientism, then it can't be real. There's nothing other than that. Skepticism, a dominant idea that um, you can't know anything. But how do you know? How do you know? But how can you know? This is why they say that radical skeptical epistemology, epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with how you know, that it has held the rest of philosophy captive ever since David Hume. Uh, because people would start trying to move forward on, on lines of thought, and somebody else would come in with the, the skeptical comment, but how can you know that? <coughs> it becomes a defeater of any other conversation. Descartes actually started that to a great extent, because Descartes said, I start by doubting everything, except my own awareness of, of myself. In other words, he said, I'm going to 
doubt my, my experience of the physical world. I'm going to doubt my rationality. I'm going to doubt everything. The only thing I'm left with is the sense that I must exist or I wouldn't be thinking about existing. I think, therefore, I am. But he started with radical doubt. And then the, the biggest advocate of this was David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, who said, nothing can be proven from past experience. That cause and effect is not rationally provable, and he's the one that said, but how do you know? He said, just because every time you've experienced something in the past, you do not have a rational, a rationally uh, cogent argument for expecting it to happen that way in the future. Exactly the same circumstances could lead to a radically different result in the future. You don't know. Cause and effect is not criteria for predicting future reality. And so in doing so, he introduced a skepticism that has paralyzed everything. And then relativism. Relativism says truth is not absolute, but it varies with different experiences. And I didn't, you know, was running out of space to be honest, and so I just listed the names. David Hume said, Everything is just, you know, you can't prove anything except what you've already experienced. It's all relative. Next experience of that same thing might be very different. Kant said that it is, everything is relative based upon how my mind processes it. Nothing is absolute. And then Schleiermacher said it's my experience of it. And that may be different than your experience of it. It's all relative. Do you begin to see how these themes really began with these people? And yet, as we go forward, you'll see how they begin to get more and more and more specific in how they affect the way our culture thinks until we get to postmodernism and deconstruction in Rujak Derrida. Um, you'll find out about Derrida if you don't know about him. Uh, he's sort of fallen out of vogue since he died in 2004, but he's still got very strong disciples. So, okay, any questions about any of that? Does that make sense? Let's see where we're going with it. Okay. Let's talk about one of the guys that used to be very important to me. He was what I described as, before I became a Christian, my, tri my trinity, which was Hume, Kant, and Hegel. G.F.W. Hegel, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, German, as if I needed to explain that. Um, everybody back in those days had Friedrich and Wilhelm in their name somewhere, okay, if they were a German philosopher or scholar or whatever. Um, Hegel, who lived at the end of the 18th and start of the 19th century, is perhaps second only to Kant in his influence as a modern philosopher. He took Kant's thinking and others. All of these people built on either agreeing with or disagreeing with the people that came before them. The key thoughts for, uh, for Hegel, he was trying to experience or trying to create an explanation for all of reality. No small task. Uh, some of these guys like Kant and Hegel were not modest. Okay? He thought he was going to explain all of reality and all of history. You can sort of tell what his goals were when you read the titles of some of his writings. A, um, a philosophy of history, a history of philosophy, a history of theology, and I'm sure if he had gotten around to it before he died, he would have done a theology of, of philosophy. Uh, anyway, he was going to explain all this stuff, and he perceived all reality as being um, in terms of conflict, that all of history and all of reality and all of existence was a process of conflict between elements. He said that, um, first he established that he believed there was an absolute spirit. He was the first one to define God as a non-personal being. He was the absolute spirit. Later on, people like uh, um, George Bernard Shaw and other writers, particularly literary people, would begin to talk about the evolutionary spirit. But it's the same thing. This absolute, or the absolute spirit, Hume sometimes refers to it, he believes is this non-personal kind of being or force that is working out its own understanding of itself in history. And the way it does it is through a series of conflicts. That there would be a thesis, some points, either an event or a state of existence, a thesis. It would be unsatisfactory in some way, and so there would develop an antithesis, a contrary. Those two things, the thesis and the antithesis, would come into conflict, and as a result of that, you would have a new idea, which is the synthesis. That synthesis, the result of the conflict of the thesis and antithesis, that synthesis would then become the formation of a new thesis, to which there would be an antithesis, synthesis, and over and over and over again. Now, he sees this as the outline of history, because 
Now, some historians have said that history is basically a story of wars. It, it's a, a long string of human conflict, and that's, ex, that's absolutely based upon Hegel. That every movement in history, every event in society is the result of some conflict that finds a resolution which leads to another conflict, which finds a resolution which leads to another conflict. Now, the thing that Hegel did was he said, though that process is the effort of the absolute spirit to come to self-understanding, this evolutionary force is trying to resolve its own understanding of itself. And he believed that there were three manifestations of that in human society. There was art, which is the lowest form. It is the use of beauty. Um, there is religion. And then the highest form to him was philosophy, the rational process. So he was very much a rationalist. In fact, he said rationality is the highest faculty above religious feeling, above, beyond uh, aesthetics, beauty of art, beyond anything else. Rationality. He falls right into that rationalistic school with Kant and some of the others. Um, and he believed he was laying out a comprehensive philosophical system that would explain all the past and all the future. Now he believed eventually this absolute spirit would come to a full understanding of itself. And reality would come to a stasis that would be no more need for conflict, and we would have a society, a human society, because he believed that our finite consciousness were limited reflections of the absolute consciousness or the absolute spirit, and that we were little pieces of trying to work all that out. And when he talked about conflict, for instance, the, the, that wars reflected that, he also believed that those conflicts most often were created by the great men in history. Um, he, he was one of the first people to advocate what's called a, a great man history of the world. Uh, he was alive during the time of Napoleon. In fact, he was German. He was living in Jena, in Germany, when Napoleon marched through conquering, in the process of conquering Europe. Weirdly enough for a German, he was a big fan of Napoleon's. In fact, at one point he, he edited a pro-Napoleon newspaper. Well, the reason why he was pro-Napoleon is he believed that these great men who came along and threw away all the rules and created conflict, they were the means by which society, following the lead of the absolute spirit, were coming to a greater understanding that that conflict was necessary. So those who created conflict were really important. So he was pro-Napoleon, the best example of that in his lifetime. The great man theory, and usually those great men are people who created conflict. So, um, his idea of this absolute spirit, he believed, uh, was doing three things. One is making clear the internal, making clear through us the internal rational structure of the absolute. He was demonstrating the manner in which the absolute manifests itself in history and nature, and then was making us aware of the end that the absolute spirit wanted to work to. And the best analogy, probably, for his idea of where we were going, the teleological or end result of the absolute spirit, was a beehive, where we would all contribute what we were intended to contribute and there would be no more conflict, there would be no more need because the absolute spirit would have come to a self-understanding and we would reach a little stasis and no longer have to have that conflict. Now, his process of, of this conflict that leads to progress, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, was called dialectic. It's a dialectic. Uh, Plato used a dialectical process where he would ask questions and they would have to answer. In other words, there was a cause and effect discourse. Well, thesis uh, the thesis antithesis synthesis is a dialectical approach as well. That's important because one of the other guys we're going to talk about in just a minute is Karl Marx, who developed dialectical materialism based upon the philosophy of George of G. F. W. Hegel. Um, so Hegel, one of the most important of all of the philosophers in modern history, again, second probably only to Kant, he, he also talked a lot, and this refers again to, to the Marxian results, to duty. I mean, using the beehive analogy. That's not what he used, but a lot of people have used it with regard to him. That every bee has a sense of duty. I have a job to do, and I have to do it for the sake of the greater good. That humanity was getting to the place where each of us would know our duty. We do our duty without conflict, without ambition, and that would lead to a peaceful society with no more conflict. Well, that's very Marxian as well. You know, Marx picked up that idea that we're all workers and we all have a responsibility, and that a peaceful society is one in which we all do our duty and nobody's in charge. Uh, it 
least everybody's in charge. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. From Hegel, they developed two main schools of thought. Right-wing Hegelianism, whenever your name gets turned into either a noun or a, an adjective, like Hegelian thought, you know you've made it. So Hegel, there were right-wing right Hegelians and left-wing Hegelians. The right-wing Hegelians tend to emphasize that Hegel made Christianity. Hegel believed that Christianity was the best example of the, the working out of the absolute spirit because he thought the incarnation of God into humanity was a perfect example of God creating a crisis conflict in order to come to a higher resolution, a synthesis. And so he advocated Christianity without the personal God kind of stuff. He, he sort of gutted it, but he still said Christianity was good. Well, the right-wing Hegelians accepted that and used Hegel to try to defend the Christian faith that was dominant in Europe at that time. The left-wing Hegelians took Hegel's ideas, and these are people like Marx and Engels and others, and declared themselves atheists and used Hegel's arguments to say there is no personal God. And so you've got a very different kind of view from the people who follow on Hegel's footsteps. But his metaphysical idealism, as it's sometimes called, uh, really was the foundation for much of what happened after him in terms of thinking. All right? Questions about Hegel? You know, the guy wrote probably 100,000 pages of philosophy. In, in, and he was a German philosopher, which means it's not easy to read, even in translation. So, trust me, when I take 10 minutes and try to explain everything Hegel said, I'm not doing him justice. The next person I want us to look at, which again, you may not have thought of as a philosopher, but he was, is Karl Marx, another German. Okay? Um, Karl Marx is co-founder with Frederick Engels of scientific socialism, which we know of as modern communism. And he was one of history's most influential speakers. From the time of his death in 1883, for over 60 years following, well, by 60 years following that, um, half the planet was following his philosophy. Communism had become dominant. Now, it is since a failed <laughs> approach. Uh, communism exists in very few places now, uh, in terms of it, it being a dominant philosophical approach since the fall of the Soviet Union, etc. But it is, we look to, to Karl Marx for that. Now, what Marx did was he took Hegel's dialectics and he applied it to economic and political situations. He's, the idea that there is a thesis, which is a situation or something that, that is unsatisfactory, you get a, uh, an antithesis, a conflict with that, and out of that you developed an ideal synthesis. Well, what Marx said was, the thesis is the current capitalistic system in the world today is that the capitalists, the people who own, are making profit off of the workers. In fact, he talked a lot about the excess uh, benefit, the excess profit. In other words, you pay somebody a wage and they produce something that's worth more than that. You, if you're the owner, you sell it and you get the benefit of that person's work. You know, you can sit back in your lounger all day drinking beer and watching football. If you own the factory, you still make a profit. And Marx was saying that's not acceptable. That that excess, whatever the value of a worker's uh, effort is, should go back to that worker. So the thesis was the capitalist system, that there were people making profit on the labor of others. The antithesis was that the workers had a right to make all of the benefit from their own labor, not just part of it. And so therefore, they had to rise up. And part of what Marx advocated was that there had to be a revolutionary uprising by the workers, called the proletariat, that word means the working class, against the capitalist property owners in order to come to the synthesis, which would be ownership of the means of production by the workers themselves rather than by the capitalist owners, right? You can see how he took Hegel's dialectic that there's a problem, a thesis, there is an opposition to it, an antithesis, and there is a resolution to be achieved, a synthesis. And Marx said, the workers are being taken advantage of the thesis. They need to rise up and take over the antithesis. When they do take over, we will have a just and fair society, Marx claimed, and that is, would be the synthesis. The, the dictatorship of the proletariat, that the working class are in charge now, not the owners, not the wealthy. 
the idea of the sort of hive mentality that everybody has a job to do, and if everybody does their duty, everybody will be happy, there's no conflict, there's no ambition, that was the goal that Hegel had outlined as being the ultimate idea, and that's what Marx said, the, the appropriate society will be that everybody has a place, everybody's needs are cared for, everybody has a job to do, and they do their duty, they contribute to the greater good, those are all things Hegel said, and in the process, Everybody's doing fine. Nobody's too rich, nobody's too poor. That was the goal. The, Marx said that in the process of getting there, there had to be an intermediate point where there was a revolutionary transition, where we had a, a, a political transition period during which the proletariat rose up against the, the uh, capitalists and took over, and it was going to be a time of conflict and revolution. He called openly for a revolution by the proletariat, the workers, against the people who were making money off of their efforts. <clears throat> this became the foundation of the modern labor movement. That's not to say all labor movements are a product of uh, communism, but it's true that all labor movements are based upon making sure that the worker receives a fair benefit from their labor, and that all the profit isn't going to somebody else. Okay? The <sighs> Scientific socialism, which is technically that's the word for what we call communism today, did become by the the, um, the middle of the 20th century had become the, a dominant political and economic theory around the world. Particularly because uh, early in the 20th century, a man named Vladimir Ilyich Lenin took Marx's ideas and launched the communist revolution. So in 1917, when the forces under Lenin victorious in Russia, and they began to grow into the Soviet Union, they put Marx's principles in place. China, Mao Zedong, did the same thing in Communist China. So he was very influential, and it's not because he actually went out there and took up arms. He didn't lead armies. He, pre he prepared the philosophy, based on Hegel's ideas, that led to this dominant philosophical idea. Okay. Now, one of the things I'll point out at this point, and I may come back to it later on, uh, is Marx defined something that we find happening from the time of Hegel on, and particularly Marx on, is a redefinition of what it means to be human. Karl Marx defined human beings as units of production. He thought of everything in terms of labor, the product of labor, and who benefits from it. And he overlaid that grid on everything in, in society and politics and history. That it was all this conflict that Hegel talked about, but it was a conflict over economic issues. And that human beings were primarily to be understood as units of production. And in doing so, <coughs> Marx thought he was doing a great service. But I think since then, we have experienced the reason that communism has failed in almost every case where it was attempted is because it ends up not valuing human beings as human beings, but rather only as units of production. So he fundamentally changed the idea of what it meant to be human <coughs> um, in, in all of those countries that accepted his philosophy. The second person that I'm going to talk about here, a third, uh, actually the third person today, but the second one on that topic, is another person you might not think of as a philosopher, but his work led to basic, fundamental, philosophical changes in how people understand things, and that's Charles Darwin. Darwin, of course, is the one who conceived of Darwinism, or evolution by natural selection, the theory that all forms of life, all forms of life, plant and animal, uh, occurred through a random process of evolution by natural selection. Now, what had happened is, prior to Darwin, and Darwin actually wasn't the first one to come up with this, there was a French writer who had developed this and had not publicized it before, and, and there was consistency in it. But Darwin's theory is that all human beings, all everything, developed by a natural, undirected process. And that addressed the last, the last absolute problem that the atheists had. And that was trying to explain where life came from, particularly where human life came from. Prior to Darwin, Publishing it and it becoming popular for Darwin. His first book, when he when he well when he developed the Origin of the Species, when he published it, it sold out in the first day. And they, following that, they immediately had six other printings of it. It was a huge success. This was a time in Britain, especially where 
anyone who wrote a book that was worth anything was going to be read by everybody. I mean, think about that. Next time you walk into an airport bookstore, think about what it was like at a time when anyone who wrote a, a, a serious book, everyone who was educated was probably going to read it. That was the case when Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species. And so his ideas were, were spread very quickly and widely. And all of those who were scientists, who were following John Locke's idea of empiricism, and that there is, that all of those that were materialists, not idealists, those who were materialists and said that reality was the physical world, all of a sudden they had an answer to the one problem they had been, un been un unable to explain, and that is how did life occur if there wasn't a God that created it? And Darwin provided that. Now, most particularly in terms of a philosophy, Darwin's evolution by natural selection, and if you don't know what that is, basically it means that in every generation of living creatures, certain ones of each generation develop characteristics that give them a slight advantage. Um, if, if they are finches that live on an island where they have to reach into something to get food, those who have beaks that are a little bit longer can reach in deeper and get more food and they're more likely to survive. And so if they survive, when they have, when they lay eggs and have more little finches, those finches will be inclined toward having longer beaks. And through a, Darwin said through a slow process, over a long period of time, that that change, those small changes accumulated to create significant changes over time. Okay, that's evolution by natural selection. I do have to say, I don't agree with him. <laughs> there is microevolution, but the idea that whole species can be created that way has never been demonstrated, and there are some problems with that. But the biggest problem with Darwinism is the philosophical manifestation in society, in term, which is known as social Darwinism. What happened was, Darwin's theory basically says that it's survival of the fittest, if you will. He's not actually the one that said that. Others, T.H. Huxley and others that followed him did. The idea that those who are strong will survive, and that that's the way it should be, because then they will produce stronger offspring, and the species will survive more. Well, the problem is you start applying that to human society and say that the ones that are stronger have a right, an inherent right, to survive at the expense of the weaker, which is what we see in the animal kingdom, and all of a sudden you get Nazi Germany killing those that they disagree with, or eugenics, a movement that up until the Second World War was the dominant scientific idea. Eugenics was the idea of controlling reproduction amongst humans in order to get rid of those who were inferior and only maximize um, the genetic processes so that the people were stronger. You know, it's since that's something that the Nazis tried to enforce, it became very unpopular very quickly in the Second World War. But it was very popular before that as a direct result of Darwin's idea, social Darwinism, that survival of the fittest means the strong should be allowed to survive, even at the expense of the weak. That is a philosophy. It was more about philosophy than science. Interestingly enough, and this was very, very commonly said by scientists in that day, Darwin had no evidence for how this worked because modern genetics had not been discovered yet. That was not discovered until the end of the 19th, start of the 20th century with Gregor Mendel, a monk. You guys were in high school biology. You remember all the different kind of sweet peas and you know all the different X, the chromosomes and the whole thing? Well, that wasn't invented until after, um, after Darwin was dead. And so he didn't have any way to explain how the process worked until Gregor Mendel, the monk, came along and explained how that happened. Um, so the idea, and where Darwin also comes into it, is the suggestion that there is a perfectionism that is possible. That every day in every way we're getting better and better. Okay, if only the strong survive, and then they bear more children and they're stronger, and they bear more children and they're stronger yet, the idea should be that in every way we're getting better. This idea that, oh, that person's dead. Nothing they ever wrote would have anything to, to, to teach us. Sometimes it's called chronocentrism, the idea that we are so focused on our own time, chronos, that we don't believe there's any value to anything any earlier, that we're getting better. I don't think anybody who realistically watches the news nowadays really thinks that human beings are getting better or wiser or smarter or anything else, but st still people believe that. That if it's, if it's happening now, it must be better than what happened back then. If it's something that developed now, it must be better than what was developed back then. Obviously, that can only exist in a scientism or a rationalism kind of approach 
Because beauty today is no different than beauty was back then. Love today is the same as love was 250 years ago. So there are a lot of other kinds of values that only really works if you deal in, in the sciences and in technology and in rationality. Okay, so this is kind of, you get into scientism and rationalism in that case, whenever you have a perfectionist kind of approach to, to humanity, okay, or humanism. Humanism is used in so many different ways. In some cases, it simply means valuing human beings and their product. But in some cases, it means believing that human beings are sort of improving all the time. Uh, so it, it's got different meanings. Any questions about Marx as a philosopher? So we've dealt with a couple of Germans and an Englishman. Yes, Pilar. Uh, so uh, I uh, had a chance to see a documentary about uh, this biography. And I think he had a daughter mm -hmm. that died, and that he was angry with God. And as a revenge, he, did, he came out with all of this because he was angry with God. How did you let my daughter die? Well, he came up with his theories very young, when he was only 22 years old, and I think before he was married. He went on a voyage, the voyage of the HMS Beagle, which was a British survey, a scientific survey ship. He was the naturalist on board. He actually had never practiced naturalism. He had at first been intending to go into theology, but decided that wasn't right for him. And so he was just, one of his teachers was a naturalist and said, you know, you ought to think about this. And he convinced him to collect specimens and stuff. And then got in this position, this multi-year trip on the HMS Beagle. And that's where he visited the Columbus Islands. And, and he was a wonderful observer. And he observed all of this stuff and, and recorded it. Um, and he was a brilliant guy. There's no question about that. There are a lot of stories about people say, oh, well, he became a Christian right before he died. There's no evidence of that, okay? Um, trust me, I'm a Christian minister. If there was evidence for him, probably, you know, one point you know about it. But um, Darwin, Darwin was not the one who really uh, made the radical conclusions that came out of his own beliefs. Those came later. Uh, there was a man, T.H. Huxley, who was called Darwin's bulldog. And he picked up on Darwin's ideas and began to promote them, and he really promoted them as social Darwinism, as the idea that this affects how human society works as well as how biology works. And so there were others who really manifested the, you know, what the meanings of all of this were. Okay? Uh, but it is a philosophical idea. Now, I said that Marx changed the understanding for many people about what human beings are because he identified them primarily as units of production. Well, Darwin, of course, his idea that human beings are uh, evolved from other lower forms of life, that all forms of life, and by the way, it doesn't mean we're evolved from monkeys. What it says is that prime, other lower primates and homo sapiens are evolved, are evolved from the same roots, but we aren't part in the same line as the, as the great apes, all right, the primates. But the idea is if we are just like all other animals in terms of evolving from a lower form, then that means we are just animals. If we are just animals, what are the logical conclusions that we might draw with regard to the value of human beings? See, we all inherently assume that human beings are more valuable. In, in an ethics class that I taught, we talked about the fact that moral ethics are only applicable to human beings. When we see two dogs copulating in the street, we don't run out there and accuse the male of raping that poor girl dog, okay? Murder, rape, I mean, all of these crimes that we assign, we never assign those to any beings other than human beings. And so we have a, an inherent sense there is something fundamentally different, especially on a moral or ethical basis, about human beings than about all other animals. But Darwin said there's not. Or at least those who took Darwin's ideas said they're not. That's where social Darwinism came in. That we basically are under the same set of rules, and we've just made this stuff up. And therefore, if somebody is strong enough to rape and pillage, the logical conclusion from Darwin's insistence that we are just another kind of animal is that, well, we accept it in the rest of the animal kingdom. Why do we have so much problems with it in human beings? Does that make sense? This, in, in that way, Darwin led directly to a very different understanding of what human beings are, which is why it led to the eugenics movement, why it led to atrocities in the 20th century, where the idea of the survival of the fittest, the rule, you know, strength makes, might makes right.
that is, that is an evolving of Darwin's ideas, that we are only animals. And so, again, he fundamentally changed our understanding of what it means to be human, even though on a day-to-day -day basis we still act like human beings are different. We, and then people will say, yeah, I, I think Darwin was right. Well, if Darwin's right, then, you know, we're no different than the dogs copulating in the streets fundamentally. Okay. And yet we say we are. We all know we are, right? There's a disconnect here. But it comes down to Darwin being another one who fundamentally changed our understanding of what it means to be human, just like Marx did. The third person I'm not going to talk about that did that is Freud. Freud identified people as being fundamentally motivated by sexual desires. And in doing so, which led to the sexual revolution and all the, you know, the positive benefits of that, okay, um, Freud fundamentally changed our understanding of what it meant to be human. So those three, um, Marx, Freud and uh, Darwin really made a fundamental difference in our understanding of what humanity is. And yet most people haven't identified that. They, they're, we're not aware of it. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the fourth person today, and that is Alfred North Whitehead. How many of you have heard of Alfred North Whitehead? Two of you. Three of you. Okay. That's a shame. Alfred, it's interesting that Whitehead often is not even listed among philosophers, and he, in fact, was one of the most important philosophers in the 20th century. He was British originally, but mo much of his good work was done when he was, in fact, at Harvard University. He was a mathematician originally, uh, and he wrote some of the most important books in formal logic and in theoretical mathematics. He wrote one book, The Principia Mathematica, he co-authored with a student of his whose name was Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell was a British philosopher and mathematician, same kind of blend, um, who was renowned as an atheist. One of Bertrand Russell's most popular books is Why I Am Not a Christian. Um, and I've read it, I don't agree with it, but that's okay. Um, the interesting thing was that since Whitehead was a, was a mathematician, and he did not, he was not trained in philosophy. The only philosophy courses he ever had was an undergraduate. At one point in his life, when he was beginning to discuss the ramifications of some, some readings he was doing, he said, well, in order to go further in this, I have to get into metaphysics, and I have no training in that, so therefore I can't do it. Well, he became a very important metaphysical philosopher. Because he, following some of the people we talked about today, following Hegel and the, the synthesis uh, process of crisis, Alfred North Whitehead identified that Reality and history, again, history was a big thing with Hegel, this whole progress by crisis. Alfred North Whitehead identified that everything was an evolutionary process. Hegel led to that, Marx led to that, you know, etc. That it was the process itself that is what created reality for us and moved us along in terms of progress. How many of you all have ever heard the only thing that's dependable is change? Right? That's why that, that process, change, is the ultimate reality. And that it is through that change that we progress, we get better. And so everything is in process. He is the father of process philosophy, and then indirectly what's called process theology, which was the dominant theology of the 20th century, along with neo-orthodoxy, which I'm not going to get into. Karl Barth. But process theology was the dominant theological way of thinking in the 20th century. How many of you have read Rabbi Kirshner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People? Anybody? That's a process theology. Basically what it says is, because Alfred North Whitehead said everything is in process. Well, Whitehead said even, uh, even God is in process. Nothing has been perfected. Everything is still moving ahead and changing. Rabbi Kirshner's explanation for why bad things happen to good people is that God is doing the best he can, but he's still in process too. He's not perfected yet, and so therefore he can't do everything. It's not an orthodox explanation for how God works in the world. And or by orthodox, I mean right belief. That's what that word in Greek actually means. But that comes directly from Alfred North Whitehead. This process theology. Now he specifically was against any philosophy of substance, which meaning there is an objective, physical, material world out there that is the nature of reality. 
He believed reality was not a fixed and permanent thing, but something that changes, something that is in process, something that has not yet arrived. And that our job is to try to be aware of that process and get on board with it and understand that we have to be, that awareness of the process and of the changes related to the process was what would make us better contributors to the reality that is the world today and the reality of tomorrow. So instead of being a rationalist that it's all mental, he believed that the primary focus of reality, which was process or change, occurred during creativity, expressions of freedom, of novelty, of growth. Not static, not rational, not just what you think. It's in the doing of stuff. You know? That as things happen, reality occurs. So it is entirely a process. That again became a major, if there's no objective reality, if there's no static reality in the world, everything is in process. You know, I hear, sometimes hear people who, uh, when anyone disagrees with one of the modern ways of thinking about things, they say, you know, well, don't get behind the curve of history. You know, you're, you're advocating something that's no longer valid in the world because we've changed since then. Well, that's saying there is no such thing as an objective truth or an objective right or wrong. It is all a matter of, all subject to change. It is all going to be different. So what is true tomorrow may very well not be what was true yesterday. Because it's all changing. It's a process. That's Alfred North Whitehead. Okay? So where we end up on all of that, if you've seen this chart down to here so far, okay? We talked about Hegel today and his, um, Hegel's rationalism, his idea that human beings are being perfected through this change process, um, the metaphysical idealism as they talked about it, then you get very practical, materialistic applications of Hegel's ideas with Charles Darwin and his materialist, you know, he, he applied those same kind of change principles to the physical world and the development of living organisms. You get Karl Marx, who took the dialectical approach of Hegel, applied it to economics and politics and created dialectical materialism. That obviously is why he is on the materialist side of this chart. Because it's what's happening in the real world. It has to do with money, which is a physical thing. And then Alfred North Whitehead swings way back over. He took the, the same kind of idea of change that Hegel had. He took some of the evolutionary process, philosophically, that Marx and, and Charles Darwin had developed, and he applied it to all of reality and said reality is entirely a process of change. Reality is defined by an evolution to a new state. Nothing has arrived. Nothing is objectively real. Nothing's for sure. Okay? So, this chart, which I showed you in a little bit bigger type, I'm going to have to figure out how to do this so that you can actually maybe read some of this stuff. I would add, under the, the, uh, under the subjectivism and rationalism, I would stick Hegel under there, because his idea that rationalism is the highest faculty, You've got art, you've got religion, you've got philosophy. And the reason philosophy is the highest of the three is because it involves using the, the rational uh, faculties. So rationality is the highest faculty. And then you get what I've called humanism here. You could use different names for it. And again, humanism has a positive connotation in, in some sociological meanings and negative connotation in some philosophical meanings. Here I'm using it in the sense that it is the philosophical and ethical emphasis on value and agency of human beings preferring critical thinking and evidence, which is rationalism and empiricism, over dogma. In other words, it's a rejection of anything spiritual or anything idealistic. It's a focus on the materialistic benefit. Hegel, Darwin, Marx, Whitehead, all four of the people we talked about today were all pretty much right there. That it is, everything is changing. We're, we're part of the process. The thing you need to do is get on board. You know, there is, there is a dialectical process occurring. Everything is moving. Get with it. Understand it. That's the best thing you can do. And human beings are intended, our goal is to be understanding of and participating in that change. Because nothing stays the same and nothing can ultimately be dependent upon the state of change. The same. Change is inevitable. Well, change may be inevitable. I don't wait to see my day yesterday. Okay? I don't have 
many hair based upon what I saw in the shower this morning. Everything changes, yes. But does that mean that values change? Does that mean that spiritual realities change? Does that mean the definition of beauty changes? Are there not some things that are not subject to evolutionary change or process or a product of crisis? If you believe that that's true, what does that mean to some of the things that we value as being human beings? You know, we talk about the really important things in life. Love, honor, trust. If none of those are reliable as being objectively true always, or valid always, what does that mean? Do we change what it means to be human? You see why these things are important? And for the most part, people don't think about these things, but we are influenced by this way of thinking. Because it becomes the dominant paradigms that exist in our society. And that's where we're going on with this. <clears throat> any questions about any of that? So now you know everything you need to know about, about Hegel and Marx and Darwin and Whitehead, right? At least you have a sense. See, most people don't think of Karl Marx or of uh, Darwin as being philosophers. But their ideas had fundamental impact on the philosophical understanding that we as a culture around the world, at least in the West, what we think about and rely on now. If, if, we did, if, if Westerners did in one way accept, for instance, Marx's idea that human beings are primarily units of, of work, that we are economic creatures, then why do we spend so much time at the office? You know, why is the money we make so important to us? Our values are strongly influenced by the things that Marx said about human beings as units of productivity. If I'm not being productive, I must not be valuable. My grandfather once said, if you want to kill time, try working it to death. <laughs> Ultimately, doesn't that in one way boil down to exactly what Marx was saying? That we are units of production, and then Marx was saying we need to try to make that fair. But it starts with the idea that human beings are fundamentally units of production. Something to think about. Any questions? All right. We will not meet next week. The following week, we will talk about experience and introduce you to some people you may not be aware of. Okay? So, no meeting on the 9th, we'll meet again on the 16th. Thank you very much for being here. Have a good day.